Hi, I'm Shelby Williams with Plano City Council. And as you may have surmised by the state of my head, this was the last council meeting tonight before Christmas. So I wish you all a Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and a Happy New Year. However, we're not done because before Christmas, I have issued a challenge for charity. If I can raise on my Facebook fundraiser $7,777 before Christmas, I will do my first city council video recap of the new year in 2022 in the voice of the late great macho man Randy Savage. Oh yeah! I'm growing the beard to get ready for it. <laughs> a little hard on my voice though. But I will even snap into a Slim Jim. So I created the uh, fundraiser last night. Last I checked, we were a few hundred dollars in. <coughs> so get your donations in. $7,777 to the Wounded Warrior Project before Christmas. And you'll get to hear me do a whole city council recap video in the voice of Randy Savage. So whatever else I bring to the table, in addition to good representative government, I make things more entertaining on council. So tonight was largely a feel-good night, and um, there, were several, there were several high points of the night. I'll get to them. Uh, in preliminary open, we reviewed a few things. We had interim appointments to the Community Relations Committee and uh, the Commission and Library Advisory Board. We reviewed the comprehensive monthly financial report. Sales tax receipts are actually up $5.1 million over this point last year. That doesn't say a whole lot because last year was just awful <clears throat> in a variety of ways. Um, we have currently 3.8% unemployment as of September. That's uh, down from 5% in June. The average home in, as of September uh, was selling for $534,000. However, uh, that's up from June. Um, I'm sorry, that's down from June, but the average price per square foot has actually gone up since June, interestingly. Uh, our investment portfolio as of September 30th was at uh, around $644 million. We had a library department uh, report, departmental report. Uh, our libraries received the American Library Association designation of, or award of Library of the Future for our digital programming. Uh, we have had volunteers with the Plano Public Library System with volunteer hours amounting to $92,369 worth of uh, contributions, worth of volunteer time. <clears throat> and uh, if you have not downloaded it yet, we have a new Plano Public Library app. Go download that for um, uh, on, on the Apple App Store and Google Play. <clears throat> um we have uh, materials actually in our libraries in a variety of languages and our staff speaks in aggregate 25 languages. Um, uh, lastly, renovations, Davis Library renovation should be complete early spring and Harrington Library later next year. <clears throat> and then the Friends of the Plano Public Library, uh, not to be upstaged, donated a big fat check for $100,000 to um, the library. Now, the Friends of the Plano Public Library has been in operation uh, <clears throat> ever since 1965 when the Plano Library System itself came online and to date has contributed uh, over $2.1 million to our libraries. So thank you very much to the Friends of the Plano Public Library. Uh, we had a building inspections departmental report. Uh, the, um, I, I thought this was interesting. They build themselves as first preventers. Uh, so they review plans for code correctness, and they have three divisions, permitting, plan review, and inspections. So they're looking sure to make everything is code correct, and <clears throat> that buildings, when they are either uh, first planned, developed, or on an ongoing basis, are safe <clears throat> and up to code. Uh, we then had a discussion about the great update rebate and what I term tax abatements for all. So if you've heard me talk about this before, <clears throat> Um, the, the premise is that oftentimes we offer tax abatements to large development projects, <clears throat> and I agree with this. So consider the Toyota campus. It was a, they built a brand new campus on a green field. That green field, I don't, don't know what it was worth before, but let's just say the whole green field was worth a million dollars. They were paying ta property tax on a million dollars. <clears throat> then Toyota came in and built this great big campus, and it was worth, I think, around $350 million. Now that's a massive increase, a 350-fold increase in value. And so without a tax abatement, which is just paying a reduced amount of 
the increase on property taxes that they would otherwise have paid, they're just going to be paying property taxes through the nose. However, a city's source of taxes are property taxes and sales taxes, the optional sales tax. How, somebody building something on a green field does not necessitate that much of an increase in city services. And that's our cost, is provide city services. A little bit of increase, yes, uh, but not that much of an increase. So I don't have a problem with, the, with tax abatements. I, I think it's just because I think the property tax system in Texas, quite frankly, is unjust. <clears throat> so if the cost of city services is going up by $100, why should somebody have to pay an extra $10,000? They shouldn't, in my estimation. The thing I have the problem with is that that's open only to large developments, headquarter relocations, that sort of thing. <clears throat> I want it to be open to everybody. I want homeowners. I want um, small businesses. Anybody who's going to improve their property, uh, I, I want them to not be punished for it. It creates a disincentive. That's not to say that Nobody will improve their property if they're going to have to pay extra taxes. We know that's not true. People build pools. People, I did myself in my old home in East Plano. Um, people put on new roofs. People do all sorts of things to their property, but they still get punished for it if it's something that shows up on the taxable value of their home on the next appraisal, which most exterior improvements do because the central appraisal district looks at the satellite imagery and says, aha, you put in a pool or you put in a guest house. We're jacking up the taxable value of your home. So this new pool, you're going to be paying an extra $1,000 a year in property taxes. But it's not going to cost the city, the county, or the school board, or, or, the, or Collin College anymore for you to have that pool. But we're going to make you pay anyway. <clears throat> it's not right. So we had that discussion, um, <clears throat> and it was tied in with the Great Update rebate. It was lumped together with the discussion on the Great Update rebate. So if you're unfamiliar, the Great Update Rebate is a program offered since 2014 in the city of Plano where if you live in a home that could be a duplex, a uh, single-family detached home, uh, anything except an apartment uh, that's older than 35 years, you are eligible for um, a rebate, cash, from the city um, to go toward improvements you make to your property. So for various exterior improvements, we'll chip in 25% of the value. For various interior improvements, we'll chip in 10% uh, of the value. <clears throat> now, for exterior improvements that are going to result in an increase in the taxable value of your home, um, I agree that that should be offset for all the reasons I just gave a moment ago. However, the Great Update rebate will pay you up to $5,000 to get new kitchen counters, <clears throat> upgrade from, from formica to granite or quartz, if you want, uh, new sinks. Things you may not actually need, like they're not creating an unsafe environment in your home, <clears throat> but uh, uh, we're going to pay for it anyway. Um, and I have an inherent problem with that. As I said at the meeting, I may be dressed like Santa Claus, but I'm very conscious when it comes to doling out other people's money in the form of taxes. So I don't think that tax handouts should be uh, uniquely given to individuals. Rather, they should benefit the public in general. And just having nicer homes, I don't think is enough of a benefit to warrant giving individuals a $5,000 check. <clears throat> um, that's something I would like to revisit. This was during a preliminary open. We didn't take a uh, vote on anything. We had a discussion. I don't think there was any uh, support for getting rid of that aspect of the great update rebate. <clears throat> um, it's interesting to note that um, Plano has invested $4.2 million calendar year to date. Maybe that's fiscal year. No, that would have to be calendar year to date um, to property owners, while property owners have put in $27.6 million. Um, good for the property owners. Uh, I don't see that it's taxpayers' responsibility to provide the $4.2 million. That said, there are individuals in certain circumstances <clears throat> like a, um, a, 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 fix, a person on fixed income who's retired has an older home and it's uh, incurred significant damage, maybe from Snowmageddon earlier this year, and uh, the damage to the pipes is significant. They may genuinely need help. There are a number of nonprofit and faith-based institutions that are equipped or could be equipped to help them, but government has a habit of crowding out charitable institutions 
by <clears throat> by providing it through tax dollars, um, which number one limits the amount of disposable income that somebody might otherwise give to a charity to provide that same thing, but on a voluntary basis. And number two, because of that same dynamic, a charitable institution might be perfectly willing to raise money to provide for folks who need that, <clears throat> who need their pipes fixed, and it might be a huge bill. Um, but because government's doing it, they just can't solicit the, uh, the funds anyway. Um, and this program, the Great Update Rebate, is not means tested. <clears throat> so I don't have to actually have a need. I could have, I could have plenty of money to get the job done, but I'm going to get the free money from the city anyway. <clears throat> and I, I just have an inherent problem with that. <clears throat> so those two things got wrapped together, the tax abatement concept for all and the Great Update Rebate. <clears throat> um, I am going to explore an efficient mechanism to provide the concept of the tax abatement for all. It's got to be comparatively simple <clears throat> and it has to be uh, it has to not cause more damage than it helps with um, and bear in mind whatever we are might be able to get done within the city of Plano we account for less than 20 percent of a person's overall tax bill but every little bit helps um, there is a separate multi-family rehab program for um, uh, 15 plus year old apartments uh, that have exterior improvements only um, $130,000 of taxpayer money has been paid to that uh, against $1 million in investment by property owners <clears throat> for those multifamilies, multifamily uh, developments. Um, <clears throat> so then we moved into the regular meeting, and this is where the feel-good thing started. <clears throat> so first was recognition of the Comprehensive Plan Review Committee, Planning and Zoning Commission, our PISD partners, and uh, our consultant, Freeze and Nichols, and uh, our, our city staff, the planning department, uh, city management, city communications and outreach. And I had asked for that, for, I and mean, we were gonna give special recognition anyway, but I'd asked for something uh, very nice to be given and for it to be given to staff, uh, a commemoration of this. Um, I was not expecting council to get it because I, I assume we're gonna have our name on the plan anyway. <clears throat> but uh, everybody got a very nice um, memorial to this. In fact, I've put it on my shelf here. I'll show it to you. <clears throat> so this is a very special commemoration of the uh, new comprehensive plan, the 2021 comprehensive plan, which we just recently passed. Um, <clears throat> this is a significant achievement um, on the part of everybody who contributed, and I'll read it to you. It says, in recognition of your valuable contribution and commitment to the Plano Comprehensive Plan process, your representation helped bring reconciliation to our community and resulted in successful adoption of the Comprehensive Plan 2021. Your contribution will positively impact Plano for years to come. Thank you for your commitment and dedicated service to the City of Excellence. While this happens to have my name on it, many of these went out. Putting this down again. <clears throat> many of these went out. And that echoes my appreciation to everybody involved in this. This was uh, no easy process and it was no easy feat. And as I've said before, I was skeptical that we would ever uh, get a plan out of it, that we would be able to meet the 75% voting threshold of the Comprehensive Plan Review Committee, the CPRC. We got unanimous votes all around. This was adopted unanimously. Nobody can say this was railroaded through over the objections of citizens um, <clears throat> while it does not perfectly and all at once heal our community. It, cer it certainly um, makes a fantastic start toward reconciliation and healing the wounds of our community. So um, in addition to these awards, my most sincere appreciation to everybody who had a hand in uh, making this happen. Um, the, uh, so that, that was just very special. Um, we had uh, consent item L pulled. This was the noise ordinance permit process. So we've had a couple of changes to the noise ordinance uh, over the last <clears throat> couple of years you know, that I've been on council. Um, most recently, the concerns have stemmed from uh, Windrose Tower, <clears throat> which is a uh, basically a condominium tower uh, right next to Legacy Hall, which is a live music establishment. <clears throat> they have, uh, I think it's 1,500 capacity uh, outdoor um, live entertainment establishment, and 
the the noise from legacy hall at ground level isn't that great because there are a lot of uh, buffers but because it's an outdoor venue it's open air the noise travels up to the uh, <clears throat> the units at legacy i'm sorry at winrose tower and there's just nothing in the way it can be very loud so a number of residents have spoken about this for uh, uh for the going back almost a year uh, at several different meetings <clears throat> and We've uh, investigated this. I myself and other council members have visited Windrose Tower to hear for ourselves the issue there. And one of the things that was proposed, in fact, two of the things which came about tonight, uh, the thing I've always been pushing for is to, if you're gonna measure the noise ordinance in terms of whether it's at an acceptable decibel level, measure it from where it matters. <clears throat> Traditionally, it's been measured from the property line. But the property line is, it's arbitrary from a noise or even a nuisance standpoint, whether I brought up the uh, case of an odor. <clears throat> if you're standing downwind of somebody burning tires, for whatever reason they'd be burning tires, um, then you could be very far away from the property line and still be hit full in the face with burning tire smell. Um, if you are um, upwind from it, you could be right on the other side of the property line and not really smell a thing. Doesn't bother you. <clears throat> so. It should be measured from where it matters, measured from where the nuisance is received. That was done in tonight's ordinance revision. <clears throat> but another thing, this tonight's ordinance revision uh, provided for a permit process for live entertainment venues. Um, now, the catalyst for all of this is Legacy Hall, of course, but it's applicable to anybody with a live entertainment venue. So we have daytime and nighttime thresholds for noise. Uh, as decibel levels, and they vary district to district, residential, mixed use, commercial, industrial, etc. <clears throat> so what the permit process does, it allows you to extend the daytime noise levels for two hours between 10 p.m. and midnight on Friday and Saturday nights and New Year's Eve, <clears throat> if you are granted a permit. So there's a whole process you have to go through for the permit, and that's what tonight's ordinance revision was about. It was about establishing that permit process. Doesn't mean anybody who wants a permit is guaranteed it because it's got to go through a whole public hearing, um, the application process, people within uh, 500 feet have to be noticed, HOAs within 1,500 feet have to be noticed. So uh, some, some residents of Windrose Tower spoke at the council meeting against this change. Um, and uh, Councilman Riccadelli pointed out that this only enables the permitting process. It does not enable Legacy Hall to go ahead and operate. <clears throat> so that did pass 8-0, which means I was in favor of it as well. I believe we should have a permitting process, but as I said when this concept was first raised, I want to make sure that the impacted residents are properly notified, have every chance to weigh in, <clears throat> and can... Uh, can act as a, a severe stumbling block when there is a, an actual concern, when there's an issue. <clears throat> what I really want to do is make sure that uh, in when developments go up near entertainment venues, existing entertainment venues, that they provide appropriate soundproofing to their development so that uh, their residents aren't bothered. Um, and likewise, when an entertainment venue goes up next to existing residential areas, which could include hotel, anywhere where people are sleeping and trying to get some uh, peace and quiet, <clears throat> that they appropriately um, uh, soundproof their establishment and make sure that doesn't disrupt the neighbors. So this, uh, this could manifest in a variety of ways across different areas of Plano. Uh, and so we want to try to make sure that uh, these things are appropriately taken care of and foreseen. It's impossible to foresee all uh, situations, but we want to address it as best we can. Uh, so here's another good, fee another feel good segment. We got to the renaming of city facilities. <clears throat> now, we on council were given a heads up as to what various places would be renamed, uh, but the public was not. And most importantly, the families of the people for whom things were renamed were not given a heads up. <clears throat> so we did um, rename the Pocket Park at 15th and K Avenue um, uh, to Masonic Square to recognize the very long history of um, uh, the Masons and the Masonic Lodge in Plano. <clears throat> um, we renamed the Day Labor Center uh, behind the Best Buy to the um, 
Adrian Magellanes Day Labor Center in recognition of his tremendous contributions there um, and the difference he made. Unfortunately, we lost him last year. Uh, we renamed the Parkway Service Center after the late, uh, we renamed it to the Gerald P. Cosgrove Public Service Center um, in memorial of the late Jerry Cosgrove, Public Works Director, who passed this year. And even though he has not passed, and we hope he has, does not do so for a long time, uh, former Chief of Police, current De Deputy City Manager, Greg Russian, uh, we recognized his long service to the city. He was chief of police for approximately 823 years in the city of Plano. Um, we are renaming the police substation on Robinson Road, the Gregory W. Russian police substation. Now, Chief Russian is going to retire next month in January. He was our chief of police. Uh, he um, accepted the promotion to deputy city manager and now he is retiring as deputy city manager. Uh, Fire Chief Sam Greif <clears throat> has been promoted to Chief Russian's place as deputy city manager, which brought us to our next agenda item, which was we needed a fire chief. So for the first internal promotion in a long time, uh, we have promoted, and formally tonight, we promoted Assistant Chief Chris Biggerstaff to the role of Chief of Plano Fire Rescue. So congratulations, Chief Biggerstaff, <clears throat> and uh, welcome to the role. Uh, then we moved on to the Consolidated Annual Performance Evaluation Report, uh, CAPER for short. This is basically the required annual report to state how we used HUD funds. Um, <clears throat> there was no vote taken. But in order to receive uh, money from federal money from HUD, we have to produce this report every year saying how we spent the money. And so uh, that was reviewed. And the last and marquee item on the agenda was yet again, the campaign finance recusal ordinance was up for modification. This has a hist uh, storied past and this was uh, the weirdest vote I have taken on city council to date in uh, my two and a half years. <clears throat> so. September of last year, 2020, um, at the time, Deputy Mayor Pro Tem Riccadelli and I uh, brought up for discussion uh, some measure of uh, campaign finance reform. We discussed several ideas. Um, <clears throat> most of them were, uh, were rejected, but the idea of recusal, it wasn't outright rejected. It just wasn't approved. Um, we sought more information, and the city attorney uh, did some research and sent us instances of where this has been done across the country. <clears throat> and then some months later, uh, Rick Smith and Lily Bow brought forth uh, a proposed ordinance <clears throat> that required or, <clears throat> required or said should recuse themselves. Basically, anybody who has received a th more than $1,000, $1,000 and one penny, <clears throat> from anyone with a substantial or material vote before council. This could apply to people with a development project, it could apply to people with a big contract facing the city or an economic development incentive, anybody with a unique and material interest. Wanting my taxes lowered is not a unique and material interest. Um, wanting a noise ordinance passed is not a unique and material interest. Somebody is going to uniquely benefit from council's vote. It's meant to say that if somebody's given you a ton of campaign contributions <clears throat> and that person comes before you with a vote before council, you should recuse yourself. Now, laws already exist regarding recusal for people who receive personal remuneration. <clears throat> if uh, uh, I receive um, contract money or a paycheck from somebody who has a vote coming before council, that's a conflict of interest and I should recuse myself. Nothing exists, uh, at least in Plano, to say that people who um, donate handsomely to my campaign to get me elected, uh, I should recuse myself there. So it's meant to uh, address the same appearance of impropriety for such situations. And that passed um, last December. Uh, unfortunately, it was under fairly tragic circumstances that Councilman Rick Grady well, well, just tragic circumstances. The councilman Rick Grady was not in attendance and it passed. Nobody knew he was going to be out. Um, there's speculation there. Nobody knew. Um, <clears throat> and it passed in his absence. Um, it came up again with the new council, people wanting to revisit it. And 
So we had a, a discussion in August at which uh, numerous citizens came to say, do not get rid of this. Um, it was brought up for repeal and uh, a ton of citizens showed up saying, we want you to keep this. And council listened and said, okay, we, we hear you, we understand. In fact, we wanna make this better. We wanna make it stronger. Uh, so it came back for subsequent dis um, discussion and we discussed uh, various ways to change it. Uh, we could just impose a strict cap on campaign donations. Uh, we could um, revise the language with applicability to PACs, and we could, this was um, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Prince's suggestion, to put a time box on it, and I was in favor of that. Uh, right now, it's just in perpetuity. If somebody gave you a campaign contribution a million years ago uh, and has a vote in two million years' time, that still applies. But... Uh, uh, I, I suggested making it four years, not two years, because we serve four-year terms, and most big considerations, whether it's a development, a big contract, or a relocation, um, they often have runways greater than two years, but it's not very often that they have a runway greater than four years. <clears throat> so we agreed on that, but only that at that meeting back in, um, I think it was August, um, there wasn't an appetite to... Uh, make it a Class C misdemeanor, which I also wanted, um, or anything else, but there was the support to time box it, and everybody agreed to four. Um, so when it came back up at the next council meeting, it was taken off consent agenda. We were just going to pass it. Um, well, actually, no, I, I'm sorry. Um, we never actually had a, um, a, a final vote about whether anybody was in favor of the other things, like the Class C misdemeanor, etc. Uh, we were running right up against the time it was uh, time to begin the regular meeting, and um, we took a pulse. Everybody uh, gave a show of hands about whether they wanted to um, time box it to four years. Everybody said, okay, and we moved on. And I felt there was unfinished business. So we brought it up again, pulled it off consent and said, I'd like to address these other things. We don't have to belabor the discussion just to show a hands. Do you want to add the other elements? <clears throat> there was an appetite to add anything else, but then it was brought up. Well, I want to change this back to two years. Um, and so then everybody said, okay, yeah, two years, not everybody, but enough people, I should say. So then it came back again. That was in, um, uh, we tabled it and staff was going to revise the ordinance and bring it back to us if I'm recalling correctly. <clears throat> and then, uh, at the last, not the last meeting, but a couple of meetings ago, it came back up again, <clears throat> uh, in consent agenda. It was pulled. We discussed it, but we were down two council members that meeting. And so it was tabled ultimately to move it to another meeting where those council members could weigh in. That was tonight. <clears throat> so more people came from the public to speak, which is always fantastic. And we had a lively discussion about this, but um, Councilwoman Homer, Julie Homer, she had raised the concern before that because she's serving in an interim uh, seat, or an interim term, uh, just two years, this un fairly impacts her. And I didn't think it would, but I, I, I actually uh, put the puzzle pieces together tonight. Um, somebody had mentioned that during the campaign, her campaign, she received $1,000 from somebody. <clears throat> um, the uh, <clears throat> Many, many years ago, that same person had given $15,000 to another um, council member, which is what this was supposed to address. <clears throat> but um, she, Councilwoman Homer received $1,000, and then I realized <clears throat> because she's serving an interim term and she's going to be up for re-election in just two years, not four, like any standard term, <clears throat> this would apply to her because if she were to then receive the same donation amount from the same person, $1,000, that would then put her at $2,000 uh, within a four-year time period, and, and it would apply. So I was wrong in my assumption that uh, it would apply equally to Councilwoman Homer as to anybody else. The fact that she does have to run sooner does put her at a slight disadvantage. And so I made a motion to amend the proposed revision. There was a rewritten ordinance before us providing a two-year time box. I made a motion to change that two years to four years with a provision that anybody serving an interim term that instead of being four years or two years, it would just date back to nine months prior to their election. <clears throat> and this is where things got really weird. Um, 
Anthony Riccadelli seconded that motion. Well, first I withdrew it before I made the connection about Councilwoman Homer's situation. <clears throat> and I just said, four years, just standard. That got a second. And then I realized uh, my error. And so I withdrew my original, which was actually my revised motion. And I restated my original motion. Four years, except for people serving an, uh, an interim term, in which case it dates back to nine months prior to the, uh, their election. <clears throat> that got a second from Anthony Riccadelli. And the discussion spun off. <clears throat> there, were, there were multiple ideas that were discussed. <clears throat> so it wasn't just a clean motion second vote. Um, and then people started, or people on council started saying, well, look, this is getting too confusing. Let's just leave it alone. Um, let's not amend it. Let's just leave it alone. And I clarified at the uh, beginning of when I first spoke that we haven't actually adopted any time box um, revisions to this yet. We just gave direction about what we wanted the ordinance to come back and say. <clears throat> so the ordinance currently is as it was passed a year ago. Um, we never actually modified it since then. We just discussed it a lot. And so it came back tonight with the uh, new language for us to vote on with the two years. And that's what we were debating principally. <clears throat> and the more detailed the conversation got, I think the greater the appetite of many council members to just, uh, just let it go and not debate this anymore. And so I had the motion in the second to change two years to four in the proposed revision to the ordinance and provide that carve out for interim terms. And by that point, the mayor said, okay, everybody, everybody clear, a vote in favor of this is to amend it to, two, to four years with the nine month provision for interim terms. And a no vote is to just leave it as it is. Leave it as it is, is without any time constraints. <clears throat> Um, and the oddest thing <clears throat> is me, council member Riccadelli and Rick Smith all voted in favor of my motion to amend the proposed ordinance. Everybody else voted against it, which means, and there was clarification on this in advance, um, voting against it actually resulted in the strongest version of the ordinance between the options. And... That's what happened. Uh, the three of us who voted in favor of my amendment uh, were voted down five to three. Nobody else made any other motions, um, which honestly is what I had thought would happen. I would make my motion to amend. If that failed, somebody else would make a motion to pass as written, and then we'd get two years. <clears throat> but that didn't happen. And so we have the original um, ordinance as passed a year ago. I'm very pleased with that. And so if... Uh, somebody does uh, have a vote coming up 2 million years from now, and they did receive a, a contribution in excess of $1,000 a million years ago, it will still apply to that vote 2 million years from now, unless, of course, this uh, ordinance is modified in the next 2 million years. That is it. <clears throat> I wish you all a uh, very Merry Christmas and a very blessed holiday season. Please spend some time with your uh, families. Be thankful for what we have, and I will see you in the new year possibly in the voice of the macho man, Randy Savage. Good night and God bless.